Hey, this is Bob, and I just wanted to let you know that this podcast was recorded on Thursday, right before reports that Biden had warned Netanyahu that there would be consequences if Israel didn't improve the humanitarian situation in Gaza, and before reports that this warning had led Israel to open a new aid corridor to Gaza. Now, we'll have to wait and see how significant this does or doesn't turn out to be, and the same holds for reports that Biden told BB he wants to ceasefire very soon. I haven't seen reports that anyone in the administration is warning about withholding military aid to Israel, and I suspect that the administration is a long way from really using that kind of leverage. Still, this latest round of news has led to more conversation about that possibility. So since we begin this podcast by discussing Biden's failure to use that leverage or any kind of real leverage, I just wanted to let you know what information was and wasn't at our disposal. Anyway, pretty much everything we say is still relevant. In fact, a lot of it is actually more relevant by virtue of these recent developments. And I think it's a very good discussion. And if you like it, I encourage you to smash the like button or share this on social media or rate and review the podcast or do whatever it is you do when you like things. Okay, so here's my conversation with Derek Davison and Daniel Besner. Oh, look, it's the guys from the American Prestige podcast who have stumbled into the non-zero podcast or else it's the other way around. No, I think we've stumbled into yours. I think that's exactly. that's fair. Well, thank you. You're the podcasting godfather, the guru. Oh, we you're worship too at kind. your feet. You're too kind. But keep that's it up. That's true. <laughs> I always think you should be up there. Like they always point to like Bill Simmons and Mark Marin and Adam Carolla. I'm like, no, dog, it's Bob Wright. Bob Wright yeah. is the initiator. Uh, I was podcasting when they were gleams in their father's <laughs> eyes. That's exactly, exactly. Reflecting off their millions you of dollars. You blazed the trail. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know what went wrong. I don't know what went wrong if, if I had first mover advantage. But let's, I don't know how I wound up hanging out first, with guys like you. First you mover know? disadvantage, it turns out, in um, this case. Apparently. Uh, so... A lot happening in foreign policy. Uh, that is true. I, I would, I would have thought that if ever there was a week when one might hope, however naively, that Joe Biden might seriously consider suspending weapons shipments to Israel, this would be it. And I, and I'm not just talking about the uh, strike on the aid workers, you know, but also the strike on the Iranian generals in Syria, which I thought was kind of underplayed, maybe partly because of the strike on the the aid workers, but. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it's less, certainly less visceral. You have to make that argument about sovereignty and and, and embassies, right? So, or, or like, Wait, what is? Can I can I just say one thing about that? Yeah, for sure. Yes. Like, yeah, I'll, the, I'll the, allow New, it. <laughs> the New York Times did this thing, like, well, is it or isn't it a violation of international law to uh, you know to hit an embassy? Because after all, the explicit international law about embassies is mainly about the host country not attacking right. the embassy. Well, that's possibly because. That law started evolving back before there were airplanes. You didn't have to worry about any other country attacking. But that aside, that aside, it's a violation of international law to kill anyone in Syria because the Syrian government didn't give you permission. But we've become so accustomed to these strikes by Israel and Syria, and for that matter, to America striking whoever the hell they feel like striking, that like, you know, that goes without without notice that it that it clearly is a violation of international law. I mean, law. Syria is a non-country at this point, right? I mean, as far as the United States is concerned, as far as Israel's just, concerned, they just do what they want. I mean, it's a playground. the U.S. is yeah. squatting on a third of the country with no permission from anybody just because we're doing it. Because who's going to stop us? Yep. So anyway, <laughs> I interrupted you, Danny. Should we introduce ourselves? You're Danny Bessner. Uh, I'm Danny Bessner. Derek Davison. Uh, da Derek Davison. Yeah. That's Derek Davison. Bob, right. Bob Wright. Yeah, that, no, I wasn't making any sort of brilliant point. I, I was just saying that I think it's it's less immediately um, resonant because it, it 
there's like a second step of understanding why this is a bigger deal than it might uh, uh, seem at first. And, and the aid workers is obviously such a, a brutal thing to have happened to people who are trying to do well. It's uh, much more emotionally visceral, I think, to most people. But it, uh, I, I agree in terms of, you know, if historians were looking at this in, in 10 years, they'd be like, oh, yeah, this was a big week for the aid workers, but also for this strike on Iranian territory, at least technically. Yeah. I think it's it's and I mean, I know the answer. I mean, it's obvious why, but I think we should still maybe sit with it for a minute. The fact that the strike on the aid workers is horrific as it uh, was and as intentional as it seems to have been has elicited vastly more outrage than the deaths of thousands of children, the starvation of at least dozens of children at this point. The deaths in among those among the thousands of civilians who have been killed in Gaza, scores of other aid workers have been among those deaths, but they've been Palestinians. So, you know, obviously that's the reason why this elicits so much outrage, including from Joe Biden, who, you know, we maybe we can talk about that New Yorker interview with Aaron David Miller and, and Joe Biden's right, I was, stark just lack of empathy up, yeah. for, for <laughs> Palestinians. But. Um, you know, it's uh, I still think we should sort of absorb that for a second, like why that's happening or the fact that it it's happening uh, when uh, nobody to this point at at uh, at least the top levels of this government seems to ca have cared all that much about the vast number of dead people uh, in Gaza to date. Well, there have been the ritual expressions of concern and regret from the administration. And was this any more than a ritual expression of concern and regret from the, I mean, it seems like they just kind of keep it in step with what they perceive to be the public level of outrage. Right. I mean, yeah, Biden I mean, as it's outraged as the average right. you know, Democrat or something. Right. And um, I mean, even that's, I think, illustrative, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I do think there's this uh, the statement that Biden put out was, I mean, you remember, Bob, when he put out that statement marking, you know, uh, uh, I, I can't remember what he was marking at this point, but it, it was marking some number of days since the, the start of the conflict. And it was all about the Israelis who died on, who were killed on October 7th and said nothing about the Palestinians. And people were angry about that. Um, and now, you know, this statement that he put out about the the aid workers is much more emotional, visceral. We're, you know, we're talking about it's all rhetorical, obviously, because they're not doing anything to change the policy. But we're talking about him being uh, outraged and uh, in, in just using terms that that have never been used before in reference to to what's happening. Yeah. Although, I, I, are there any signs of that translating into anything concrete? Like no, no. I mean, they've, leverage? they've they've said as much like this isn't going to change anything uh and and i mean you know they you had john kirby the other day saying not only you know do we not think this was a, an intentional uh war crime we don't think the israelis have ever committed a war crime or have not at least since october 7th we have no uh, indication that they've committed any war crimes, which is crazy, even under normal circumstances. If we weren't as if we even if we weren't watching them commit war crimes regularly, it's impossible to to think that you could be doing what they've been doing for six months and not have done it. It slipped a little once, mm -hmm. once, but not according to the Biden administration. Well, you know, there was this piece in 972 about uh, the way you featured this in your newsletter, I think, the way they've been using uh, Israel's been using this right. AI thing called Lavender, a little euphemistic, um, for uh, uh, compiling kill lists. Smidge. And this shouldn't be confused with uh, an earlier 972 piece about some different AI they were using uh, called the Gospel a couple of months ago, because what that did, that AI targeted buildings that were likely being used for military purposes. This focuses on individuals, and it assigns a probability that they are militants based on their observed behavior, and then it focuses on killing them wherever they are, and them being at home sleeping with their families is not considered a deterrent. In fact, one person was quoted not, as saying that's preferred because— Right. Not only is it not a deterrent, that's what they—that's, the, according to the piece, that's their preferred place to go because they feel certain that they will— get the, the the target that they're aiming for. They're also going to kill the family. They're also going to kill anybody in uh, surrounding buildings. But, you know, that that doesn't matter, apparently. 
Yeah. So um, I don't know. I I uh, I mean, I, I want to just be clear. The reason the Iran thing concerns me is that, I mean, this was a major escalation. I mean, in, in, along a number of dimensions, three Iranian generals, including a very important one on Syrian soil and apparently within a dip, the diplomatic compound of of the Iranians. I mean, it, you, you just can't invite retaliation any more robustly than that. And of course, Iran, contrary to stereotype, is actually a very careful and rational actor, and they will calibrate the retaliation as they did after Su uh, the killing of Suleiman um, in, in hopes of, uh, of not starting a war. But this does increase by some number of percentage points the chances of the U.S. getting sucked into a war, even if it's just from like 5 to 7 percent or something. And what I'd like to know is, did Israel clear this with the U.S.? Because if not, that is 100 percent unacceptable. Like, you know, I mean, just in terms of like textbook relations between superpower and nominal client state, you don't do that. And I don't know. Am I the only person like getting upset about this? No, I mean, you're absolutely correct. Derek, there hasn't been any information about that, right? The intelligence communications or the military communications between them right now. I don't so think we have so. no I idea. Think, yeah. I mean, the, the, the Biden administration has said they had nothing to do with it, which if you take that at face value for, you know, if you're inclined to do that. Uh, suggests that they didn't even know about it, that they... Yeah, that but who they, knows? I mean, they die dying, so but, often. Right. But, but yeah. that's an <laughs> indictment of its own kind about... Yes. Uh, right. uh, about this this relationship between the U.S. and Israel, if they yeah, did, it's very yeah. it's very strange. I mean, again, it's just this is this is why uh, Bob, we've always talked about this, but you really got to focus on what's going on at home if you want to restrict the empire. It's just gotten to a point where you it, it just allows anything to happen because there's just no. Well, it'll be interesting to see if there actually are domestic consequences in this particular case in in November t t to be decided. Uh, but I think it just indicates like if. The people of a country aren't actually directly suffering from what their country is aiding and abetting abroad. People just don't really care that much as a general rule. I, I'm, this is why the uncommitted thing is actually quite interesting. It'll if, if Biden loses to Trump, I do think it would be difficult not to see a Democratic Party shift on its uh, policy toward Israel. Uh, but if he doesn't lose, then I think we're just going to get more of the same. Yeah, I will say I've revised, I don't know if you remember, uh, like I, it was two or four months ago when we did one of these. And Danny, you said that if Biden's handling of this is blamed for his loss, that could have an impact on American politics. And I kind of dismissed that because I, I said his loss is going to be overdetermined. It's going to, it's going to be, there's going to be so many things at work. But I will say that as this has played out, I think it's more likely that there will be that kind of uh, conspicuous legacy of this whole thing. And, and there will, you know, it'll, it'll have an impact. The impact of this on the election may have an enduring impact on well, well, American opinion. It's all about, I mean, just to borrow Bob Jervis, right? It's all about perceptions. So who, who is doing the perceiving in this case? And it would basically be DNC party elites or Democratic DNC elites and, and Democratic Party um, elites. And, you know, in their circles, certainly people do care about Israel and Gaza. So, you know, even if the election is overdetermined due to economic whatever factors, um, It'll seem to them that it has to do with Gaza, or it'll seem to them that it'll have to do with international relations. So I think that's why you might actually see uh, a shift in it, and then you know leave it to the historians to determine why exactly something um, proceeded as it did. But I think it will be perceived as having affected Biden's loss should he lose. I mean, the poll numbers are, are getting worse and worse for him on this issue. The number of Americans. Yeah, on this issue, he doesn't look, he's very old. Trump is also very old, but Trump has a vitalism, right? So there's a lot of things, I think, pushing against Biden um, beyond just this one. But I think this one has a, a resonance in the people who, you know, determine political strategy. Uh, so he, that's he why looks it like a loser. It. I mean, he looks like he's getting rolled because he is uh, probably uh, every day by Benjamin Netanyahu. And you, you can't. That's I, regardless of the the specifics of the issue or the policy, it just makes him look ineffectual, like a doddering old man. Well, because that's what going he is, into right? an election, a, he, he is. But yeah, I mean, this is the problem, right? At it, some it point, it feeds like... that. I mean, it all feeds <laughs> into that narrative, and and 
you know, amps I mean, it I mean, up. He, he is a very old, obviously not extremely well man. It's just at some point your lying eyes aren't going to deceive you any longer. This is common sense interpretation of how he literally acts in the world. I don't <laughs> care about the State of the Union speech, which by the way also wasn't that like dynamic as people were claiming <laughs> in the in the day after. So it's just like I, I've used this term a lot, but it's all kayfabe. Um, and this is, you know, not a not a good way to run a political candidate. It's also a good way to make you feel nuts. I'm I'm less uh, convinced that there's going to be any change. What what's going to ha- what I think is going to happen if he loses is you're going to see the Democratic establishment do this incredible two step. Where on the one hand they blame everybody who's been pissed off over uh, the Biden administration's policy on Gaza for causing the defeat, and at the same time on a dime they will shift to supporting a ceasefire and condemning the Trump administration for whatever the Trump administration does to continue supporting. And I, I mean, that's assuming that this is still going on a year from now, which, you know, would be horrifying. And yet I don't see an off ramp. You've got the Israelis talking about uh, spending months in Rafa. Uh, as, and, and even if they, you know, the heavy activity there uh, is finished, Sooner than that, I think there's still going to be a military occupation. There's still going to be uh, some action taking place there, and and some deprivation of the civilians. And so I, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's inconceivable. This is all still going on a year from now. No, I think that's right. I, I think maybe I should reframe it. Thinking about medium and long term Democratic Party responses, um, you know, it, it took a while for the quote unquote loss of China in the autumn of '49, and then the Korean War before the Democratic Party, you know, embraced particular policies um, when, it, when it came to foreign relations. And I think if he does lose, th- this would auger or perhaps auger, you know, moving the Titanic, um, as it were, <laughs> from the iceberg, uh, a, a more medium term shift. And, and that remains to be seen. I agree with you, though, in, in the actual war that's going on in the short term. Um, if Biden wins, it'll be relatively the same. If Trump wins, I also agree it'll be relatively the, the same. Um, I think what's what to me. And again, without being overly morbid about this, but what's going to change Democratic Party policy on this is the gerontocracy. Yeah, yeah totally. Uh, spinning 100%. off into the afterlife uh, right. and leaving uh, the next generation, uh, which at that point will probably be in its 70s, uh, to actually run the party. <laughs> the next generation of, uh, uh, of, sep- of what is it, yeah. septuagenarians in Right, of retirement age people. <laughs> I love this country. Yeah, it'll take a while. Um, <laughs> you know, I wonder uh, if uh, I was wondering about like Blinken and Sullivan. Like, Anthony did they Blinken, realize the guitar player? The guitar player, <laughs> yeah, the blues, you, you, you the blues singer, singer guitar guitar player. Did you? Yeah. Oh, he's. Yeah, how is he involved here? Uh, well, that's a question. <laughs> is he involved? <laughs> I mean, I was wondering. It's like. You know, one one hope people occasionally express is like Sullivan and Blinken will go up to Biden and go, look, this is really bad. I mean, the lady, there was a poll this week saying that not just most Democrats, but a majority of the country opposes U.S. military support for the war in Gaza. 52% of Americans, numbers much higher for Democrats in this poll. Uh, and now, I, I, I will say, I, I concede that, that Biden, he has no great choices here uh, because the old guard is strong. And that's, of course, what he viscerally identifies with himself is the, the establishment kind of uh, Israel lobby. But in one scenario, Blinken and Sullivan, I guess he, here's my, I'm, I'm, I'm just grasping for, you know, kind of dreams here. And in one, they kind of realize that you know, they mo- may go down in history as as fundamentally more than anything else, just abetting war crimes, right? Because, you know, traditionally the deal was, well, if you want to work in this town again, you can't cross Israel, right? Well, I mean, it That's seems to me- That's less true, I think. It, well, and with these two guys, it seems to me if they have a hope of working in this town again, it's it's to cross Israel in a sense. I mean, if this ends the way it looks like it's it's going to end, with Biden's handling of this a complete disgrace, and this thought of as a humanitarian disaster that the U.S. could have done much more uh, to curtail, um, 
and the, and 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 Blinken and Sullivan were the guys. I don't think there's going to be a future Democratic administration that wants them uh, to 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 work in it. And it seems to me slightly more likely that uh, the Biden policy could be so discredited that they'd have a better chance of working in this town again if they resigned in protest. And I'm not. I'm really not kidding. One can imagine a, a future Democratic administration in which that gets you a job. I I mean, maybe I'm being too optimistic here. Well, but I think they'll make do with their Raytheon board membership, right? I mean, this is the well, problem. Like, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean they'll that, go that's back why to that places needs like to be West, made West, West Exec right. or uh, right, right, right. corporate boards. Well, if that's all they want, sure, but... Yeah. E or well, they could go even, to Netflix like President Obama. <laughs> and they'll get, I mean, I'm sure they'll get, you know, uh, chances to be... Uh, uh, guest faculty somewhere and yeah, have a nice, the, you cushy, know, various you Ivy know, League universities. Spot. I mean, it's interesting. <clears throat> I mean, people have done this comparison post Vietnam and post Iraq, but after Vietnam, there there was actually a social cost. The one that I always point to is that Walt Rostow wasn't able to go back to MIT. He was uh, exiled to UT Austin. Uh, didn't really happen though with Iraq, right? So that means I think again, what's the difference is that there were masses of Americans dying in Vietnam, and there weren't masses of Americans dying in Iraq, and so you might just have a, a, a a, a transformation in the consequences of people supporting disastrous American wars mm -hmm. just because flat out fewer Americans are or perceive themselves to be directly affected. Big change from the Vietnam era in the 70s. You know, we didn't get the post Iraq church hearings. Why not? It's yeah. kind of strange we didn't. And so something has changed, obviously. I mean, there were little things with Iraq. Like Don Rumsfeld was a Princeton graduate. Traditionally, if somebody becomes Secretary of Defense and they went to your college, you at least have them back to give a talk, right? And probably you tell them that if they'd like a job at the public policy school, which was then called the Woodrow Wilson School, they can have one. He did not set foot on that campus, except maybe he showed up for reunions or something. So there were little things. But look, obviously you're right. And, you know, this is one problem now, I think, is that uh, the, you know, people like uh, Jeffrey Goldberg, who did as much as any one journalist probably to get us into the Iraq war, uh, were they tarred for life? No, there was a, there was the, the inevitable ascent of power. And now he's editor in chief of the Atlantic. Now it, it's, by the way, a, a, a comment on something that even the Atlantic uh, uh, recently had uh, some piece uh, severely critiquing the U.S. policy on Israel. So that's interesting. But no, your larger point is is right, that it takes a lot for there to be any kind of house cleaning or accounting in the wake of a foreign policy disaster. Because well, they're all guilty, right? I mean, like, ultimately, if you really wanted to, any presidential administration, you'd be able to find something basically since the beginning of U.S. history, but especially since the, the 1945, the ascent to hegemony, right? So you can't, they can't really do it. They can't really hold anyone accountable because then they're putting a target on their back. Uh, at least that's the way I view it. It's right. just like, this is, this is the, what, the wages of empire. This is what happens when you run a global hege uh, hegemonic empire. And so you can't really go after anyone because then you're, they'll go after you and it's, it'll never end. Not that I'm saying that's right. That's just yeah. what I'm saying, how they perceive it. See, I, I don't know that green strategy plays as big a role as just short-term political incentives, and that's why— No, it doesn't. It, it's short-term political incentives are far more important, but they're all primacists, right? The grand strategy is basically the same, but when you're looking at, like, within that larger structure of we're going to rule the world, you're 100%. I just published an uh, edited volume about this very question, uh, we're thinking U.S. world power, which shows how it's mostly domestic political processes that shape U.S. foreign relations, at least to a significant degree. And if you take out a second mortgage on your house, you can pick a copy up today. <laughs> is, it, is it pricey, Danny? Um, the, the, the volume you edited, how much does it cost? Uh, 160. Okay. Well, listen, I think I'll wait for the paperback. <laughs> or 150. Or why don't you just do a long podcast about it? And maybe I'll, I'll spend a walk kind of absorbing. Academic publishing, that's a whole topic we could do on. Yeah, so <laughs> um, that industry. What a what a what an industry. So at some point, uh, I don't know if we're there yet. The paywall, the paywall shows up when we do these joint podcasts. Um, is is it that time or or what? who's who's the timekeeper here? I think you are, Bob. We we follow in your footsteps. <laughs> That's a lot of responsibility. Okay, let's um.
Let's let's wait like three more minutes in before we do that. And uh, for starters, we can explain that that you can once the paywall does show up, um, you can uh, listen to the rest, watch the rest by being a paid subscriber to either American Prestige or the Non-Zero Newsletter. And by the way, if you're a paid subscriber, either you can get a twenty percent discount on the subscription to the other, the paid subscription to the other. Is that true? That yeah, that's still there. Uh, we'll have link. We'll have a link in our uh, show description to your uh, discount and vice versa. I think. Yeah, if you, I think the way it works at our end is we'll have a link in the show notes to the episode on Substack for this, and uh, there, in that post below the paywall, will be the below the paywall twenty percent yeah. link. Yeah. Um, but what I want to talk about when we uh, eventually. Uh, on one side of the paywall or the other. And by the way, is that too crass a term? Someone someone advised me against the term like paid subscriber. Like I should call them premium subscribers or members or paid I don't know. That or... forecloses on the possibility that you could get another tier of people paying even more money and call them premium subscribers. That's a good idea. <laughs> That's a good idea. Milk it. Paid and really paid subscribers. Yeah, Those there you go. Paid things. and really paid. Um, <laughs> but what I want to, uh, one thing I want to discuss is to get back to like micro political incentives. Talk a little more about what exactly is Joe Biden's like mental world. Like, what does he perceive out there? There really are things. There really are disincentives to do what we would like him to do and exert actual leverage on Israel. But I'd like to spell them out a little more. Um, because I'm not I'm not sure exactly what form they take, and maybe you guys have insight into that. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly political a political risk to coming out against Israel, or if he had on October eighth come out and said, "This is you know this is what you get for occupying uh, a territory I for uh, no. seventy five years or you know well not seventy five years but but since nineteen sixty seven whatever whatever um, you know if he had done that there would be there would definitely have been a big political cost to be paid in terms of donors in terms of voters in terms of just the general sentiment uh, of the American public but I don't think now six months later with everybody having watched what's gone on that that's still a, a risk if he just did even the most mild thing of uh, conditioning weapons sales or weapons transfers, which is in concert with existing U.S. law. I mean, he's breaking the law at this point by continuing to send weapons to Israel based on what we know they're doing. Mm -hmm. If he just followed the law and said, look, this is, you know, six months down the road, look at what's happened here. We can no longer continue to enable this, I don't think he would pay that price at this point. He would pay some price with like elite donors, mm. but with the voters, I mean, as you say, the, the polling is, is, has shifted markedly over these past six months as people have observed what's taken place. And I don't think yeah. that's the salient thing anymore. I think the salient thing is that for Joe Biden, Israel is frozen in 1973 and he's still talking to Golda Meir about uh, the 1973 war and, and Israel under attack from three different directions. And he still views Israel in those terms as this underdog, this beacon of democracy and, you know, a value, shared values and in, uh, in a difficult region that is under constant existential threat. And that's like ingrained in him. It's not going anywhere. The thing you, you keep seeing in, in these pieces that that people do about like what what's really going on? Like, why are there no consequences, no red lines, no matter what? What what people keep coming back to Jonathan Geyer just did a piece at, at uh, the American Prospect about this. It, they come back to this is Biden. This is Biden driving the bus because this is his depth of feeling for Israel and his can his belief that after, you know, 40 years or 50 years of being a relatively for the Senate, at least a uh, significant figure in terms of Dem Democratic Party foreign policy, that he knows what he knows and he doesn't need to take right. any advice from anybody. And he can he's fully capable of managing this. That's it's this is this is Biden. It's his mindset. 
Yeah. Okay. I have something to say about that. I'm sure Danny does. Uh, I also want to talk about uh, what a Trump foreign policy might be like, including like on this issue. But I guess it is time for the paywall to uh, materialize. Yeah, this is where the gossip comes in, everyone. Pay, yeah. pay to hear our gossip. You got to pay yeah. for the good stuff. Yeah. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Uh, and hope to see you on the other side.